the low make it show. Professor Richard Wilf is joining us today. He is the founder of Democracy at Work. Uh, he is a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts. His latest book is The Sickness in the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics for Itself. Uh, you can go check that out where you buy good books. You don't do it on Amazon, as we all know. Hey, Richard, thank you for joining us. So um, I just want to start off with uh, this 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 debate that you had on the serfs. Um, Lance from the serfs comes on our show a lot. You debated capitalism versus socialism. And I don't you know, really want to get into the drama of it all. But what I'm really curious about, about the, having this debate online right now, right? Having it on, on a platform owned by Amazon, Twitch, um, having a debate with you <laughs> versus somebody who's a, a Twitch gamer, great, they can have opinions and, and thoughts about politics. I felt like there was some sort of meta story here about capitalism. Did you did you did that ever cross your mind when you were having this debate? Absolutely. I, I kept wondering whether I was talking to him or talking to some someone behind him or something else. Yeah, I had the very strong feeling that there was something going on that I wasn't quite sure what it was. I mean, and, and, and how, when you say that, is it, you're not sure what it was, um, meaning like, was he speaking to an audience to get view? It, I'm, I'm, I mean, I have my perspective on this, that there are a lot of these conversations online, people have different intentions and goals when they have them. Um, there's like a performative aspect of, of, right. of, of this. And I think you probably go with, in, with the intentions of informing listeners, whether or not there's four views or 50,000 views or 4 million right. views. Um, but others will, will not be in the best faith and, and, and have these arguments as if it's some sort of good faith argument for the views. Yeah. You know what struck me most, uh, and that your questions remind me of? Um, socialism is back in the air, having been pronounced dead more than a few times. Here it is, once again, demonstrating to us uh, what a number of us have said for a long time, that socialism is capitalism's shadow. You're not going to get rid of your shadow. It's part of the way the world works and nothing guarantees the future of socialism so much as capitalism itself, because it's the provocateur that brings us to socialism. And I kept thinking in that debate that there was a kind of rehearsal on the other side of a pretty standard collection of by now kind of old, kind of tired oppositions, and they're just no match for the new life, the new excitement. Uh, of a rediscovery of socialism, a reimagining that the world can do better than the capitalism we have all around us. And almost in a sense, my heart went out to my adversary because he had a harder, he had a harder road to, to hold here than I did because I, I was riding the wave as it was coming up and he was being sucked back down by the wave as it was going out. So just to pivot a little bit, um, you know, you, you, we, you've been talking about poverty for, for a long time. There's this new uh, campaign by the, by, by, by who, I don't know, the Bill and Melinda, I guess it's just the Gates Foundation yeah. types now. I don't know what you, what you call it, what the new name is. But, um, but that, that circle, the Davos circle, that right. capitalism is, uh, has reduced poverty globally. And I know you got a lot of thoughts on that. But I do. The most, <laughs> but in the most basic way, um, how is it that I, I live in New York and before the pandemic, inequality was worse than it's ever been? Uh, but simultaneously, yes, poverty has been, I guess, statistically down. How can these two things happen at the same time? Well, I think my response to all of that is a kind of intake of breath of the amazing nerve of people say such a thing. Uh, is it a fact that the standard of poverty is not, it's not as grim as it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. No one is disputing that. But the notion that we should credit capitalism for that, I find that's mind-blowing. 
every single step of improving the problem of poverty was fought against the opposition of capitalists. To this day, it's the capitalists in this country who fight against raising the minimum wage. It's the capitalists who don't want to give supports to the family, who don't want to find ways of making it possible for people to get out of poverty. I mean, wow, this is an example of people who have fought hard against everything that relieved poverty. Having lost that fight, they now want to take credit for having achieved what they tried so hard to prevent. I mean, it takes your breath away this kind of nerve. I mean, wow, capitalism was the obstacle against which poverty was overcome. I mean, the whole 19th century, for example, was a century in which the working classes of the world fought to reduce the length of the working day from 16 hours to 14 hours. You know, the May Day holiday celebrated around the world came out of the events in Chicago in 1886 that were demonstrations for the eight hour day. The business community fought it every step of the way. They were eventually defeated. Now they want us to say, look, isn't it nice that we have an eight-hour day? Hello. It's, it's like um, child labor. The capitalists used to love to hire six, seven, eight-year-old children. New York City is, and Chicago are famous for that. That had to be fought by people. And they were told by the capitalists, well, look, we're doing a favor to these poor families. If they couldn't send their little children out, they'd be even poorer than they are now uh, to work. And the rest of the world went, wait a minute, uh, that may be good for you as a businessman or woman, but that's not good for the families of these children. So finally, we got rid of child labor. Should the capitalists now be allowed to say, see, we got rid of child labor? No, 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 no. That's reversing the game. Having lost your opposition, you now want to take credit for what you could not prevent in the end. Um. You know, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm working in Puerto Rico right now on, on a documentary uh, that has a lot of uh, elements of austerity politics. And right. I've been interviewing a lot of people I probably wouldn't normally be uh, talking with and hearing their version of, of the solutions that need to be made in Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's it, it's fascinating because when you just talk to average Puerto Rico, it depends on, you know, who you're talking to, obviously, but um how much of like this new version of capitalism taking credit for uh, you know less poverty is juxtaposed with austerity politics when you have capitalists you know influencing government um, when you have right wing governments and and center left governments uh, putting austerity on 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 well, in the island of Puerto Rico it's very obvious and then switching to privatization they just privatize the power authority here and. And their whole claim is, well, now it's going to work. And uh, that's how we get, you know, poverty. We, we eliminate poverty is now we have a working power system. Is is this sort of, has this always been the game or is it is it more pronounced now that that the solutions are coming through privatization, aka capitalism, and that government was never the solution? Uh, in fact, that's why, you know, you can't get, uh, it takes you two hours to get uh, to work every day on these broken roads, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No, this comes in waves. I mean, the history is pretty crystal clear. You have a period of time in which, for example, the private sector just fails. The best example in this country is the Great Depression. Uh, once it hit in 1929, and it, it kept going all through the 1930s, it became the cliche of almost everybody that private capitalism left to itself is a disaster. And the, the government is brought in as the solution. So we had the New Deal, we had Roosevelt coming in there, regulating, taxing, uh, uh, hiring people, creating social security, extraordinary intervention to, that produced what we, what we called after World War II, the American dream, uh, a, a working class that could afford a home, that could afford a car. Sure, they had to pay on payments. They had to take a mortgage. They had to take car payments and all the rest, but they could do it. But that was the failure of private capitalism bringing the government in. It terrified the business community. 
The business community has always been celebrating competition in their 4th of July speeches while killing the government for daring to compete with them. Rather than letting us, the public say, let's see. Let's see how the government produces something. Let's see how the private. And then we will vote with our dollars where we want to go and what we want. uh, to. No, 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 no. Must not be. So by the 1970s, you have the reverse wave. You have the government is the problem, not the solution. And the privatization is the solution, not the problem. It's literally upside down. What we're living through now is the early stages of another cycle in which the private is more and more looked at as, whoa, look at what you messed up and the government is called. You can see it, for example, in all the climate discussion. The private sector messed up the environment. It threatens us literally uh, all around us and we need the government to come in and do this or to do that and, and we're going to see it more and more and that's part of the return of socialism anyway as an idea that is associated in people's minds with that time when the private looks to be in trouble. I might mention to you just as a matter of fact that the the wave is further developed in Europe. There's a dozens of examples where electric utilities Uh, where water systems, where public transportation that was privatized in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is now being republicized as the government comes in to bail out the bankrupt, dysfunctional private. But we should see that as back and forth. That has been, if you like, a bit of the genius of capitalism. It keeps us focused on whether it should be public or private rather than on questioning the system itself, because in the end, whether it's a a government official who sits on the board of directors deciding what happens, or a bunch of private individuals elected by shareholders, the basic structure of everyday life in that enterprise isn't that different. And if you want to solve the problems, you've got to deal with that rather than, you know, it's a little bit like saying if only we had non-white people sitting on the boards of directors, or if only we had women, or if only, I'm talking about the people that have been traditionally excluded from those jobs. Of course, I'm in favor of including them. But if that's all you do, you're much more likely to have those individuals adjust to the system than the system break from its tradition because it has fresh new individuals allowed in to play the game. How do you envision the global economy shifting post-pandemic? Oh, there's a number of things that are going on. It, it really is, if I can dare to put my hat on as a professional economist, uh, the world is changing very fast. And if people feel a little bit overwhelmed, they shouldn't blame themselves. They should understand that they are caught up in the winds of change that are terrifying our leaders in this country, uh, whom I know in many cases personally, uh, I can assure you, they do not know what to do. They do not understand the depths of the problems. The honest ones will admit it, at least to people they know, like me. So uh, I can assure you, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, it's not you. (laughs) It is the situation that you are in fact facing. So let me give you some examples. We have had three major wars in the last 25, 30 years, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And in the minds of the rest of the world, every one of those wars, the United States lost. I know in America, it's hard to get your head around the notion that this could have happened, but no one in the rest of the world is at all ambivalent about what happened here. That's a very important reality. That has to become, you have to come to terms with what that means. Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq are among the poorest countries in the world. The United States is one of the richest. Uh, We have the military, nobody in the world comes close. And we lost. In the history of empire, that's an unmistakable signal and symptom. Number two, for the first time in almost a century, we have a really powerful competitor in the world, and that's the People's Republic of China. 
a reality to which Americans are now, you know, waking up and taking some cognizance. I'm not an alarmist. I don't think that has to mean war. I don't think it has to mean catastrophe, although if badly handled, it could. But whatever else it is, we have to come to terms with the fact that the world is now different. Let me give you one example. The Chinese decided some years ago to focus in on making solar panels to make the best, you know, those panels that convert sunlight into electricity, basically. Uh, They're the best in the world. They completely dominate the market. They went to work to do that. They produce the best quality at the lowest price. The United States now doesn't know quite what to do because it's completely outflanked. I mean, the number one producer in the United States of solar panels is a Chinese company that relocated here. I mean, it it is as grotesque as you might want as an example. But to be angry and to denounce them, which is what we're doing, that solves nothing, changes nothing. It means the rest of the world begins to realize, and here's the danger, that if you're a company in Norway or France or Italy, you want to be careful about developing your business in the United States, because you don't know when a Trump or a Biden or who knows who is going to weaponize the United States market, use it against you, hurt you. That So you, you, you think oh, this is isolating the United States. Again, like other empires, it means the United States is not going to have the wealth of investment and the wealth of options that it used to have. I could go on. Look at the pandemic. I mean, the whole world is scratching its head. The United States has 4% of the world's people and 20% of the deaths from COVID. Uh, I can't think, you know, I live with statistics. It's part of my job. I can't think of a statistic that screams its message louder than that one. We are a very wealthy country. We are a highly developed medical system of which we can be proud. But but when it came to the worst public health crisis in at least a century, we failed. We could not put together the doctors, the nurses, the ICUs, the tests, the, the masks, the ventilators to deal with this problem as effectively as countries much poorer with much less developed medical systems than we have. Something is very amiss in our society. That's why we're so upset with one another. That's why the divisions are as bitter as they are. All of these are signs of an economic system that has peaked and is now going down. I don't mean to scare folks. But we had a good ride, we Americans, over the last 150 years. We went from a small colony of England when we soared up to become the global superpower. It was a heady ride. It meant wages went up. It meant people came here from around the world to participate in this wonderful ride up. Uh, But now we are on the other side of that process. And going down is a very difficult, bumpy, scary process. The only model we really have in our own recent history is the decline of the British Empire, which we should be studying so we don't have the kinds of problems they did. But that's the reality. And I understand it's hard hard for people to get around. But if you ask me what the post-pandemic U.S. economic forecast or let's put it this way, landscape is, Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I have to tell you these things partly because the mass media shy away from it, which I partly understand, but isn't a smart way to cope. So uh, looking for China being obviously um, a superpower that is, is, transitioning to to their being the the lead superpower i guess um how does that inform and i you know and and they've they're buying up real estate and ports all over i <laughs> uh, you know i live in my family lives in greece and there's like a lot of conversation about the ports of greece being um bought up by china which is a very real concern yep they the bought the, they bought piraeus the, piraeus, the major exactly. the major port uh, outlet from athens some years ago, and they've used it to move across Europe. Very effective. That's right. Exactly. Very, effective. Very strategic. So 
our relationship with the United States' relationship with Europe, uh, the EU, and, and of course that has an effect on, on the Mideast as well. Um, but I'm curious how like our relationship with the global South, the rise of the left in the global South, hopefully keeps going. Um, and, and simultaneously, this, this, this strange rise of the right in parts of the EU, how that plays out while China um, is just is just being super st- thinking. I don't know how long in advance they're thinking, but pretty far in advance. How, how how do you see this all kind of like playing out geopolitically? Well, I think that the Chinese are showing the world something actually similar to what the United States did. The United States made a commitment to go in the direction of a private capitalism. It, it had to switch to a state run uh, or state regulated during the Great Depression because how disastrous that was. It frightened everybody, including the capitalists. So they, yeah, they said okay to Franklin Roosevelt to really massively intervene with the government. Uh, and he did that. And he did it for them as much as he did it for anybody else. But immediately thereafter, immediately in 1945, when the war, Second World War is over when Franklin Roosevelt dies in office as a president. We saw the business community recoil, recoil from the government having coming in so massively in the 1930s to be followed between in World War II with the alliance of the United States with the Soviet Union. It was like a nightmare of the arrival of the other uh in our society and we had a reaction it has to be understood that the post world war 2 period in america very very important there was a coalition that won the new deal it was the cio the massive union movement the greatest unionization drive in american history by far millions of people who had never been in a union joined the union these were people whose parents had never been in a union they joined the unions in huge numbers they joined two socialist and one communist party here in the united states in very large numbers and they all worked together the communists the two socialists and the unions and they were a very powerful force, which terrified, you know, remember in 1929, you're really only a dozen years after the Russian Revolution. It's in everyone's mind. It's not some ancient historical event. It's it's real. And people were terrified, the capitalists, the business class. And after the war, they they were very smart. They understood that the problem wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, he was dead anyway by then, but the point, it wasn't him. It was the the push from below, the unions, the socialists, the communists. That had to be destroyed for fear that it would forever transform the American system and put the capitalists not at the top of the pyramid, but somewhere in the middle. They didn't want that. So we had a real purge. It started with the communists. Instead of them being gung-ho leaders of the unionization movement, they were converted into evil uh, agents of a foreign power, and they were persecuted, and they were imprisoned, and they were deported. And as soon as that was done, we went after the two socialist parties. And we basically explained to Americans that socialists are like communists. They just spell it differently. Which, you know, is bizarre, but my students in the United States, and I've been a professor here in the United States all my life, they think communist socialists, it's all the same thing. Something no European would ever think. They all understand the difference because it's real, uh, not here. Uh, And now, ever since, we've been destroying the labor movement, which has been in a decline for 50 years. So we've destroyed that whole left mentality so that it has to now be slowly recreated, which it's happening, but it's very slow. It's nowhere near as well developed as Europe, which never had that kind of persecution. People who are communists and socialists have been active in the politics of Europe without interruption since the end of World War II. Nothing like what happened in the United States. And for me, I I see there all the different signs. There really is a left in Europe, and it's strong. 
You know, I, I give as an example to, to audiences in the United States, a country like Portugal, and I'm playing a little bit with my audience because they're not familiar. Americans don't learn about these things. So I play a little game. Do you know about the government in Portugal? Nobody stirs because Americans don't. I mean, they know what Portugal is, but they, they don't know what the government is. So I say, well, let me introduce you. It's a coalition government. It's got three political parties. The biggest one is the Portuguese Socialist Party. The second one is the Portuguese Communist Party. And the third one is the Portuguese Green Party. That's the government. You should see my audience. I wish I had a camera. I could just capture the eyes. The, the, the very idea of such a thing is, is foreign in the worst sense of that word. And then I say they were elected in 2016. They've been the government a long time. And last year, they were re-elected with a bigger majority than they had the first time. The Portuguese want socialists and communists in the government. You know, it, it's too much for Americans. And therein lies a very powerful uh, reality. Americans had a hard time understanding Syriza in Greece. Where could that come from? How could you have a government like that? Uh, Greeks and then had a hard time that, understanding that <laughs> Syriza. Yes, that <laughs> and if you know something about that, you know, the, the refusal of the Syriza and the Communist Party, which remains an important part of Greek politics, to work together, to keep very separate. This bespeaks whatever you like or don't about that. It bespeaks a, a, a left that's aware of itself, that has a sense of its own roots, that is has real following. In Germany, it, when I explain to people, Angela Merkel is not the, the person who won the election. She didn't. She lost. She has to have a, a government of coalition because she can't get enough votes. And her coalition partner are the Socialist Party of Germany. People look at me. And Americans are not stupid. They're just as smart as everybody else. So what's the issue? This is all kept out of consciousness. It's not processed. It's not brought in to understand the world. And I think it's going to now, we're going to pay the price of not understanding why Europe goes in a different direction. Why the Europeans, when they're told by the Americans, you must not make a deal with Russia about the gas that the Russians are sending in by a pipeline going through the northern uh, Scandinavian area. Americans don't understand it, that the Germans, well, I don't want to be impolite, but they basically give the United States the finger. You're not going to tell us where we get our gas. And you can jump up and down. We don't care if you're Trump or Biden. This is not. We are going to work a deal for us navigating between China and you. And right now, Jack, the Chinese and the Russians offer us more to get out of our problems than you do. And the Americans, I don't think, you know, Mr. Biden and his advisors, some of whom I know, they don't know how to cope. And it's not them. They are smart people and they, you know, they're clever and they have lots of staff. It's more of a mindset. We are now facing a very difficult time of transition and we're not prepared for it. The very purging after World War II was so successful here that that whole way of thinking has been expunged and now has to be rediscovered, which is happening, but it's slow. And it's behind the ball, you know, it's not developing as we need it. I, I couldn't agree more. Oh, my God. We, I would love to have you back on to talk about this, about the pace, because while it's exciting to see some electoral wins and, and a rise in, in, you know, union membership in the last few years, uh, like you said, it's it's not enough and it's not happening fast enough. That's right. um, and in the, the, the terms of power still are still set by by the neoliberals, the, the, the Bidens, who Absolutely. seem frozen. <laughs> they're they they're seem great frozen. at one thing, killing the left. That's what they're great yeah. at. <laughs> you know, they're fr you're absolutely right. Frozen is actually, a, you know, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll use that. What? That's a good image. They're frozen in, in, in ways that worked for them. Let's be mm. fair to them. You know, since 1945 is a long time ago. From 1945 to about now, They've called the shots. They destroyed their ideological, political enemies, 
Uh, they either said to the Democrats, you have to disappear or you have to become more like us. The majority of the Democrats, the centrists, became more like them. And so we, we have that very comfortable oscillation between the Republicans and the Democrats, all that post-war period. And, you know, in a sense, it worked for them. It was the period of the United States hegemony. But that yep. period is now over. They should have understood. It's always over sooner or later. It has been for every other dominant power to imagine that we wouldn't suffer what every other one does is a leap and a stretch that they shouldn't have allowed themselves the luxury of, but they did. And so now they don't know quite what to do. They, By the way, they've been trying to squelch the Chinese now throughout the Trump administration. It started even before that. It just it isn't working. And they don't seem to have the capacity to recognize it isn't working. The Chinese are not doing any of the things you said you wanted them to do. They're angry at you. They're making progress technologically to do end runs around you. You, you know, you ha you're supposed to be able to adjust if it doesn't work, right. but they're so trapped in that way of thinking, frozen, as you nicely put it, that they, they're just not up to it. And it's kind of sad to watch. I, I was a classmate. I got my PhD around the same time as Janet Yellen. Uh, we were at the same university. We were getting the same degree from the same teachers and sitting in the same room. I know exactly what her formation is. And she's part of that. She is frozen where they were because she, she wasn't a, a radical like a few of us were and were breaking away at that time. And so I know, I know, you know, I know her personally, but I also know what her formation is and that of people like her and frozen in a, a place that's now out of date. That captures it very well. Frozen in a crisis. Title yeah. of. Not a good place to be. Not a good moment to be frozen. Not a good time. Richard Wolf, thank you so much uh, for joining us. You can check out Richard Wolf's latest book. Uh, he's also the founder of Democracy at Work. His latest book is called The Sickness in this is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. So on topic, so timely. Thank you so much, Richard Wolf. Thank, thank you. you. It was a really good conversation, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of your arranging for us to have it. Oh, of course. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.